Hello, this is Fernando Gomez Sancha, and this is a video of a uh, uh, block holep case that I did in Sofia, Bulgaria, with a low power laser. The first thing I noticed when I entered the fiber is that it was quite deteriorated. And one of the reasons why you have to cut the tip of the fiber with a low power laser is because these fibers uh, do not break. Uh, during the procedure. So they get cracks in the surface, they get uh, progressively deteriorated. So uh, you have to you have to realize that the tissue effect is going to change if you don't do if you don't do this, huh? if you don't do uh, cut, you know, the, the the tip of the fiber to get a better effect. You know, sometimes if you notice that uh, hemostasis is not perfect, if you notice that uh, uh, the laser is not behaving like you would want to and you wonder why is it bleeding more than usual, why, you know, just think maybe I need to cut the tip of the fiber. Uh, with high power lasers, this fiber is breaking uh, up all the time and uh, that's why it refreshes itself and you can work uh, more or less continuously. Here uh, we are using a low power laser. The settings are 2.2 um, uh, uh, joules of energy and 18 hertz. And I think that's more or less 40 watts. Well, I should check it out. I think it's about 40 watts. So, um, you see, there will be a difference in the way this laser behaves in comparison to uh, a normal hol holmium with uh, higher energy settings and higher frequency, like the 250 we usually use. And you will see that there is uh, still more difference with the um, pulse modulation lasers that. Um, are now uh, available that provide much better cutting and coagulation. So this is, you see, this this uh, low power allows you to dissect, allows you to coagulate, but uh, I think it's uh, possibly a slower laser, and sometimes we face difficulties with hemostasis of the large uh, bleeding vessels. So. Here, as you've seen the the marking of the of the uh, white line at the edge uh, of the sphincter, you know that uh, some people are looking for this white line uh, when they see these videos. They think, "Where is the white line?" No, the white line is the line you mark to delimitate the sphincter limit with the apex. So there's no anatomical landmark that is a white line that you have to follow. It's more you have to recognize where the sphincter is and you have to mark this white line, which is going to serve as a reference for the rest of the procedure. So here, you know, the entry into the plane has been made. The connection between both planes has been made by cutting the, the tissue above the, the midline. And you see this White line has the role of protecting the, the sphincter, and especially the sphincter's mucosa. We will get a nice view at the end of how the sphincter um, was at the end. And I think it's, it's, it's an interesting case because you see there are some apical nodules and the differentiation of the plane is not easy. Uh, so. All the operation, uh, we're going to be testing testing if the, the plane is correct, if the depth is correct, you know, and there's many, many uh, small anomatous nodules that are growing into the capsule and uh, uh, make the dissection a little bit of a challenge. The prostate endoscopically looked small, but uh, it was actually quite big. I think it was about uh, 100 grams of, of uh, tissue that we took out at the end. So sometimes it's puzzling how an endoscopically short 
uh, prostate can be very wide and so sometimes endoscopy doesn't tell you the real you know volume of, of the prostate you see this apex I typically cut on the adenoma a little bit you know because I don't want to cut into the adenoma I want to separate the, 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 the attachments that unite the sphincter with the with the apex you see here we have a nodule so instead of cutting through the nodule uh, we're going to try to to see how can we release it uh, this is an apical nodule it's very interesting that sometimes when you find such an apical nodule you tend to find it also on the other side so for some reason these nodules are symmetric and i'm thinking embryological causes here you know that the, the formation of the prostate is genetically determined and uh, it's a very complex uh, process but I, I'm I'm thinking that clinically we find that often these nodules are found on the other side also so there must be some symmetry in the uh, embryology of the prostate that that leaves these germs you know these uh, cells that later on are going to give birth to these adenomatous nodules and they're probably migrating and you know or generating the prostate in a in a symmetric way maybe it's just uh you know stochastic but i suspect there must be something embryological about this so um here we are trying to do the apical liberation early apical liberation so typically Initially, we do a little bit of dissection of the lower plane. Then we try to climb, you see, on top of the adenoma with the scope. Because when you climb on top of the adenoma, the dose, let's say, of the adenoma descends. And then these 12 o'clock fibers are easier to cut. You see that we will find more tissue constantly challenging our plane and having us... To correct the the plane you see these are this is the mucosa the sphincter these are the 12 o'clock fibers initially they are parallel to the fiber but as i said when you start descending the nose of the noma they verticalize so you can cut them and initially initially i tried to cut them uh, also to make an initial liberation of the sphincter and then of course as you get a little bit deeper a little bit more proximal with your dissection you start to have to look up because um, one of the difficult aspects of uh, early apical liberation is to reach the anterior plane you know conquer the, the anterior plane communicate the dissection we're doing the ascending dissection we're doing from one side look this is the, the same nodule on the other side you see symmetric so initially i was cutting through here but i recognized the nodule and we will go back to to to, to rescue that so you see initially of course i tried to cut on the adenoma and to release the adenoma from the capsule but uh and sometimes it's not easy to 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 find where is the good plane and in this case it was remarkably like that so you know i found a plane and then i realized that there was nodules there so you see here i'm coming back this is a smaller nodule than the other side but it's exactly in the same you know symmetrical position there it goes and here i am correcting the plane again so you have to be careful at the apex when you have these nodules because of course you don't want to you want to protect the sphincter at all costs huh? so you have to be very careful you know we have we have in in madrid we have a the visit of, of richard gaston every month he comes to do robotic procedures with us he has been our master and our trainer and um, we've been collaborating with him for more than 10 years now so every month he comes and we do a session a two or three day session with radical prostatectomies and cystectomies and everything and he is an extremely talented man who has an immense experience and 
you see him operating, you know, it looks as if he's going slowly and he's doing small increments, small, small dissections here and there, you know, and he tells you, he tells you, we have to go millimeter by millimeter. And I inherited this, this phrase from him because I think in this endoscopic enucleation, as well as uh, in robotic uh, prostatectomy, many times you have to gain one millimeter at a time, you know, to start liberating the, the tissue, to start, uh, I mean, to make it possible, you know, and so you shouldn't get frustrated, you know, just get things a little better each time, advance a little bit, a little bit, and step by step, I think you will get uh, to a successful end. So here you can see how I'm challenging the, 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 the plane all the time. Uh, so we had an original plane, but I see that there is yellow, yellow tissue, yellow tissue. So I'm not afraid to probe, you know, I'm not afraid to explore because sometimes you have something that looks like a good plane or a reasonable plane, but then you find that you can go even further to, 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 to look for the real plane. And so you shouldn't be afraid to try. I mean, if you're careful and you're getting in the capsule, you're going to you're going to realize that you're going in the capsule and you will be able to stop before you go too deep. Huh? So you have to be, as I said, careful, advance in, in terms of millimeters rather than having to do very deep cuts and very, you know, just slowly, slowly, carefully, you know, try to try to probe and see and challenge. You see, if, if you see that the tissue doesn't look like capsule or it looks a little bit bumpy, you know, there's a bump on the tissue that looks like a nodule, then you have to test, you have to see if you can raise up uh, these nodules, these BPH nodules sometimes grow uh, into into the peripheral zone, you know, so when you remove them, they're going to leave a, a footprint, a depression on the, on the peripheral zone. So this was a specifically, I think, more difficult than usual. I mean, in this case, because we didn't have a beautiful plane, but we had a lot of this nodular, let's see, tendency, you know, so here, this is still 12 o'clock fibers, a little bit lateral, and I'm cutting uh, very slowly because with, with this low power, you know, with this low frequency, um, you, can, you can't cut very fast, you know, this, so here is where I miss the pulse modulation, uh, uh, which allows for a much better cutting, so you have to go slowly. And um, we, we, we use an Auriga laser uh, in, in Sofia, Bulgaria, and uh, for, for these cases, and um, it is a 50 watt uh, laser. But if we pump up uh, the power all the way, what happens is that the laser stops, you know, it gets hot and it doesn't let us work continuously. We have to wait, let it cool down and then continue. So I decided to work with this low power sometimes. I don't know, it, it behaves strangely and uh, we have to lower the power a little bit more. So we have uh, worked uh, sometimes at 36 watts. And uh, well, but it, it allows you to, to do the operation. Now you can see so there's some uh, surgeons like uh, Jesse Scofoni who, who defend this low power thinking that the, that the, um, the low power is going to cause less uh, thermal damage to the capsule and the tolerance of patients is better. I think this is, this is just a thought. I think there's no clear data that demonstrates that yet. And um, also in my, uh, my way of thinking is that when you use higher power, possibly you move much faster around the capsule. So despite, using more power, the, the time of contact of the laser with the capsule is, is, is less, you know, so I'm not sure that the laser determines what happens to the capsule. I think it's the surgeon who will 
overheat or overcoagulate the capsule uh, or not. Huh? So here you can see that also we have a slightly difficult plane. We are you know, trying to get there, but uh, this was not a forgiving case, you know, it was not a straightforward case. Of course, you could probably follow the internal plane and leave some adenomatous tissue. You are removing, you know, big, big adenomatous chunk anyway. But uh, I think if you probe, if you if you look around, if you see, you know, when you suspect that there's adenomatous tissue, if you go for it, you will develop the skills, you know, to 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 move. Uh, in deeper planes, let's say, with uh, with more confidence. And I think sometimes um, you can find a remarkable amount of tissue that otherwise would remain there. And and uh, in my experience, it's it's quite safe if you can move around and be careful and, and recognize the, the details. One of the nice things of Holmium, and I think... And I think it's specifically important in this in this operation is that you need to be present, you know. You need to be actively concentrated on analyzing the details you're getting from the anatomy. You are analyzing the distance, you know, how far are you from the tissue? What tissue effect are you getting? Are you able to coagulate at the same time as you dissect or not, you know, these these lasers, uh, these low power lasers have a worse first pass effect, I think. But um, you than 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 pulse modulation lasers, I'm I'm referring to. Um, so you have to be present and you have to analyze, you know, all the details you're watching. You know, is this tissue looking good? Should I go deeper? You know, sometimes it gets you into a little bit of trouble. You know, for example, that plane there looked a little bit deep, so I'm just guessing, I'm just finding out um, where is the plane going in this case, you know. So, that's the idea, huh? correcting, you know, checking the, the tissue, if that area looked a little bit deep, I'm, I'm going to tilt the fiber a little bit closer to the, to the adenoma, so my dissection is not going to follow the path to the deeper areas, but just uh, stay in the in the interface between adenoma and capsule. No, so and um, here again we see that the block approach provides us with a very good visibility. We are irrigating just this uh, small uh, space between the capsule and the adenoma, and uh, even when there is bleeding, you know the the the, the, the blood is going to be washed out and the visibility will remain clear. So you see, as a Holep surgeon, you have to be a very delicate uh, delicate surgeon who can, you know, tailor, tailor your incision. And uh, I think we will see also in the posterior aspect how that is true. You have to check, always uh, have the feedback from the what you're seeing, you know, and um, adapt your your what you do uh, to the to the situation that was a deeper plane that I liked more and uh, I was trying to follow that plane sometimes this this uh, attitude gives you let's say several possible planes and maybe you will see that we will leave a piece of tissue there and uh, that we will remove at the end but as I said, I think it pays off to be thorough, to be good at removing the, the whole amount of tissue. When you when you leave these nodules, I remember there was a book by John Blandy on transurethral resection of the prostate. This was the Bible for most people, you know, who wanted to learn TORP. And John Blandy used to do his own drawings, you know, and he illustrated his books with his own drawings. And they were beautiful drawings and very conceptual. 
And uh, he, he was really a master, you know, a, a guy who taught a lot of people. And uh, uh, he, he passed away some years ago and I was very, very sad. He was really a gentleman. And um, so he had a graph where he showed the, the prostate. You see, this is again a nodule, huh? You see that? So you have to probe, you have to see if what you're doing is correct or if you can go a little bit deeper and, and do a better job. Uh, sometimes the plane is so clear that there's no doubt, but some other times you have to be guessing, you know, and trying. Okay, so John Blandy did this graphic where he showed the TUR fossa. So it was like an empty orange. And he painted a small anomatous nodule left behind. So in the moment of the operation, the, the fossa is quite big. And this nodule only occupied a peripheral you know, area in this. So there was a big cavity, a small bump protruding into this cavity, which was the nodule. But then he said several months after, you know, he painted a much uh, more collapsed uh, prostate. And then this small nodule, which didn't seem to be relevant, after right after TRP became obstructive because the prostate had collapsed it uh, the total volume you know uh, of of the prostate has had been reduced and then this nodule became more relevant and obstructive so that's why i insist and i have seen many cases where one of these nodules caused problems i remember one patient i did an enucleation we took out 100 grams but we left a small apical nodule and he came back to me several months later with a catheter and he said, you know, I went to I went to to another a colleague and he, he told me he did a cystoscopy. He said you you were not operated properly. And I took out the postoperative ultrasound of the guy and, and showing this amazing fossa. And I took out the histopathological analysis and it was 100 grams of tissue, you know, and I said, what's going on? And he had just an audio at the apex, which was causing this uh, embolic effect. So it it, it uh, obstructed uh, migration completely. Uh, so we did a, a removal under sedation uh, of this uh, very small nodule in very obstructed nodule at the apex. And I learned uh, the lesson. Uh, so despite uh, removing a lot of tissue, if, if you want to achieve your goal, which is to provide uh, long-standing effect, you know, definitive effect, you have to be thorough and look for the nodules. So here, this is more anterior. You see, I'm taking my time, trying to find my way. You see, one of the nice things of, of the block approach, even when you have a relatively difficult plane like this, where you have to search and probe and and um, correct, and then you have double planes and like that, is the visibility. You know, when you have good visibility, you can, you can progress, you understand what's going on, even when you have several, several little planes. Huh? After all, we are uh, trying to, to remove the, the meat from the orange, from the capsule, no? to, to, to peel off, like Tevaho was saying the other day, I like to peel off, you know, it's not dissection through cutting, it's dissection through, you know, localization of the right plane and development of this, of this plane. All right. So here, uh, again, this is a posterior aspect. You see, sometimes the, the bump of the middle lobe uh, towards the posterior aspect uh, makes a depression there and uh, it is confusing. I, I have I have thought about this a lot. You know, the, the middle lobe is pushing down and it makes a depression on the capsule, and then but the lateral lobe is pushing lateral. So many times when you go from the posterior middle lobe to the posterior lateral lobe, you see there is like a change of plane. Sometimes, well, we're not seeing it now anymore, but 
I have referred to this uh, quite often uh, that many times you have to recognize that there is a lateral plane like here, you see, and then you get to that point where what you're seeing is the 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 the, the imprint the imprint of the middle lobe on on the capsule, and there seems to be a change of direction. So you know, always try to go to the to the limit, always try to find this this these nodules and see if if you see yellow tissue, you know, probe it because go there and see if you can take it out because that's probably an adenomatous nodule. And uh, there we are, we, we get very interesting cases in, in Sofia, Bulgaria because their healthcare system is quite uh, Difficult to access and, excuse me, someone's ringing the door. Well, I'm back. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Um, as I was saying, the, the healthcare system in Bulgaria, the primary care is, is difficult to access and many, many people just go to the hospital when they have a problem, you know, retention. We operate more patients in retention. We operate uh, more patients with stones. So we see let's say, more advanced cases than we usually see, for example, in, in Madrid. So here, uh, you see how careful and how mm, nicely you can decide uh, what plane to follow. You know, sometimes you have a very nice line of attack that uh, tells you exactly where to go, and the feedback you get from the tissue is, is good. You know, you know that you're in the right place, in the interface, there's no yellow tissue left behind, and then it's a little bit easier to, to progress. Sometimes you're more in doubt, and then you have to start looking around a little bit, trying here and there and see which could be the good plane. If you get the information that the plane is a little bit deep, because you're starting to see capsular looking tissue, then you have to correct. And and, that, and this is it, really. This is, a, this is the, 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 the essence, I would say, of the dissection of the plane. If you are careful and you don't do crazy movement or crazy cutting or you don't want to rush it too, too much, uh, then you're going to be okay. So it is a combination of... of, of skills, you know, the skill to position the fiber where you want, the ability to predict, you know, what is the energy going to do in the tissue to, to dissect the plane, and then the understanding of the anatomical information you're getting from what you're seeing, you know, the, the look of the plane, the color, the consistency, the, the presence of fibers, you know, the direction of these fibers. It's also going to tell you a lot. And um, sometimes you have to also keep in mind the spherical-like shape of the adenoma because uh, also you have to take into account where are you accessing the plane from, you know, because sometimes you are under the adenoma dissecting the the posterior plane, sometimes you're lateral, sometimes you are doing the lateral plane from below, sometimes you're doing the lateral plane from above, and that can change a little bit the relationship of the direction of the fibers you are cutting and uh, the direction of the plane, all right? So you have to take all these things into account to start you know, to understand what's going on. Of course, the, the excellent visibility helps a lot. You know, not having blood all the time that is blocking your vision, it allows you to... And here, it, it pays off to be careful and carry a good hemostasis. Yeah? With low power lasers, you have to often go back, stop the vessels that are bleeding and uh, try to, this way, uh, carry a good hemostasis. So when you finish 
the enucleation phase, you can move on to morselation uh, relatively fast. It's interesting how surgical speed works, eh? because if sometimes you see surgeons like uh, Richard Gaston I was mentioning earlier, when you see them operating, it seems that they're going very slowly, but they progress very fast because they don't lose time, you know, you don't lose time. Everything you're doing is contributing to advance uh, in the case, you know, it's contributing to, to m move things forward, but not necessarily you're moving too fast or anything, just what you're doing is sound, is solid, is properly performed. It uh, contributes uh, to the to the goal to reach the goal that you want to reach. So this is the bladder neck anteriorly. Uh, we had done an entry into the bladder, and now we have to cut the bladder neck fibers. Here, I think, is where the low power falls a little bit short. You know, when you have to cut fibers, it's very boring. It takes a while. You have to be very patient to 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 to. Go. It is, it is logical. It's like, uh, uh, how do you call them? The, 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 these guns, the repetition guns, the gun machine or the, yeah. So this, this laser is now uh, firing, uh, as I said, 18 bullets per second. You know, at two point two joules, this would be the caliber of the bullet. Of the bullet, and um, so if you have a machine gun that fires many more bullets, of course you're going to cut the tissue much faster. Huh? It's only logical. Huh? So it takes a little bit longer, but of course, if you know what you're doing, if you do meaningful things. If you keep a steady hand, it's very important. Many times when I see videos from other colleagues, it's, they're moving around so much, they're jumping from place to place, you know, it's difficult to, to, to understand where you are, where are you going, you know, just keep a steady hand, move slowly, move in slow motion, you know, you don't want to move too fast. And uh, whatever you do, you know, just has to be logical and this way you, you get to the end. Also, I have to say, cultivating this patient approach to Holop in the sense that you are progressing slowly, you know, you're, you're not, let's say you are there, you're not wanting to rush it, you know, just trying to add a little bit to the operation by doing something which is correct, which is good, which is safe, which enhances visibility, which, uh, you know, helps you progress through, through the case. Um, this prepares you very much for the very large glands. You know, when you do very large glands, it is very important to be patient, to be calm, you know, because uh, and to progress, you know, this philosophy will take you to finish the case. Mm, sometimes when you, of course, you're building up your experience, you have to face a larger gland and you cannot get anxious. You cannot get uh, to panic, you know, you have to be quite relaxed and just move forward. It'll take longer or no, you know, you shouldn't have this pressure. Huh? You shouldn't put it on yourself. Um, and this way you will get to do the large glands as well. Of course, in this operation, if you stick to the principles, you know, progressing in the interface, not going excessively deep, removing the adenoma, keeping good hemostasis, etc., then you're going to be able to uh, do this operation successfully. So, this is the end of the operation, just uh, cutting the 6 o'clock attachment.
here uh, sometimes if I feel it's uh, more more comfortable here I lost my way a little bit but if you feel that um, it is more comfortable I would turn my fiber to six o'clock sometimes you know it's okay like that but there it is huh? that's the end of the nucleation phase all right so we carried a reasonably good hemostasis. Maybe there's some small bleeder. It's uh, very easy to, to tilt to push the noma into the bladder. And then we will do the trimming phase and the hemostasis phase. Yeah. This is what we are seeing now that with pulse modulation, it is not so needed anymore because you get a much better first pass hemostasis. And um, but overall, I think the visibility is uh, quite good. Just have to find if there's any vessel bleeding, you know, these pumpers, uh, these pumping blood vessels can obscure visibility and can complicate the postoperative recovery. Here I realized that I left, you see some tissue, but this is not so important, I think, this is something you can perfectly do at the end of the operation. You know, if you see any remaining tissue, just remove it because these little bumps of tissue, they're viable. I mean, sometimes they're so coagulated that they will just fall off. But if they're viable, you know, if, they, if there is BPH tissue there, you will, you can have this situation where the prostate will collapse and the nodule will become more prominent and maybe exert an obstructive effect. So that's a little bit more hemostasis and a little bit of struggle to, to remove that piece of tissue due to the limited cutting properties. You know, my machine gun here is not so fast, so you have to be careful and fire it, you know, several times until you can get your It's important to remember that you, you cut with the light, huh? so you, you don't cut with the fiber. So you shouldn't be using this the fiber as a sword to, to cut the tissue because it won't cut it. Huh? Sometimes, well, you get a little bit closer trying to get a an enhanced cutting effect, but the truth is that it is the light that has to cut the, the tissue and not the fiber. Huh? So trimming phase, finalizing phase, making sure that there's no big, you know, remaining nodular tissue or even, I mean, if, if this is already almost dissected, but it's still hanging from there, it's probably going to cause the patient some discomfort. Ultimately, it will fall off and he will ha have to pass it, you know, and he will be very scared if he passes a piece of tissue. So I think it's a good idea to, 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 to check if this happens. But you can see there's a nice fossa, there's a reasonable, reasonable visibility. Here you see that the fiber is again a little bit degraded at the tip. So if, if you are doing hemostasis and you find that the hemostasis is not happening properly, then just take it, the fiber out, cut it with uh, normal scissors. You don't need to have specific scissors to, to cut the fiber, just cut it with a scissor. And uh, that's the nodule, that's the noma for ready for morselation. So <clears throat> that's the change. We have an excellent team in, in Sofia, Bulgaria. It's so comfortable to work with um, the nurses and uh, the people who are helping in the anesthetic team in the, in the operating room. They really work very, very hard to to make this uh, very, very uh, successful, you know, uh, situation. Sometimes we do eight, nine, even 10 cases in one day. My personal record is 13 cases in one day. That was too much, maybe. But uh, we can comfortably do eight or nine cases from eight in the morning to 5 p.m. And uh, that's because they have a very fast uh, turnover. 
they're an extremely efficient uh, team in, in Sofia, Bulgaria. I think this is one of the reasons why visitors benefit not only for the, I mean, not only from seeing how the technique works and how things are carried out, but also it's very inspiring to see the teamwork and how Holip, which was traditionally, you know, a complex operation which could take hours. Um, you know, if you streamline all the processes, so the nurse knows her job, the anesthetist knows uh, his job, uh, the you know person who is helping you with the morselator knows the morselator very well, then things things happen uh, in a very organized, uh, quiet, uh, relaxed way. And uh, we can we can do this uh, eight or nine cases sometimes, you know, one hundred grammars, uh, you know, typically in less than one hour. Huh? This uh, morselation is very efficient now, so this is a big big advantage, and uh, it allows us to take out uh, tissue very very fast. Very, very fast. So it's no longer a painstaking, you know, process where you had to wait and you couldn't see and then you had to go in and coagulate again and empty the bladder, fill it up again, you know, which was time consuming and exhausting for for, for the surgeon and, and, and the personnel around the surgeon. And uh, it's now much easier, much nicer, much faster. And it really changes the picture a lot. So I'm very excited to see that we get pulse modulation lasers, we get fast morselators. I think soon we will have a lot of options for miniaturized uh, endoscopes. Huh? So instead of using a 26 French, we can use uh, 24 French, uh, 22 maybe. So it would be very nice to have better hemostasis and, and like that. So here, I think the, the morselation of the big piece uh, has finished, but I decided to have a last look, last look, you know, in, in Bulgaria, it's a poor country and uh, the irrigation bags are very expensive. So we try to make sure as much as possible that the patients will not really need a lot of irrigation postoperatively because that is quite expensive and it uh, we have to be very careful and it's I am much more liberal let's say to to use the the resectoscope at the end of the procedure to check if there's any you know mucosal bleeding this is the most typical uh, bleeding postoperatively you know the mucosal edge you know, the explosive uh, nature of HOLEP sometimes makes the mucosal incision a little bit rough. In the same way, when we cut the mucosa at the apex, we get bleeders. Uh, when we cut the mucosa at the bladder neck, we get bleeders also. So, And uh, these bleeders often are looking towards the bladder. And when you go in with the laser fiber, you don't get to see them so easily. So sometimes this this final check uh, with our sectoscope is helpful and it reduces the amount of uh, postoperative bleeding. Probably if we put a catheter, the, the bleeding will be there for some time and then it will subside. But as I said, we try to be as thorough as possible to prevent uh, bleeding postoperatively. If there is bleeding postoperatively, I think it's imperative to go back to the operating room, not let uh, the patient bleed. You know, sometimes you, you think if I wait, maybe it will subside. But I think if you see bleeding that is abnormal. I think early, early, and look at the sphincter. Eh? It's an excellent preservation. I think this is the end of the procedure. I think there's a small nodule there that has to be taken out and possibly the end. That's uh, going in again, yeah, going in again to check the bladder, and uh, I think that's that's the end. So I hope you enjoyed the case. Uh, thank you for your attention. See you around. Bye-bye.